Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Scrutiny Management Committee public hearing session with the committee, uh, the Policy and Resources Committee. So today we're going to be focusing on many of the um, issues contained in the committee's mandate. I'm Deputy Yvonne Burford. With me on the panel today are Deputy Simon Fairclough, Deputy Adrian Gabriel, Deputy Andy Taylor and Mr Mark Huntington. So following this session, uh, the Scrutiny Committee will decide if any further review activity will be undertaken and a Hansard transcript will be uh, published in due course on the website. Can I just advise everybody that we are live streaming this session? Thank you. We'll take a short comfort break around 3.30, so if everyone could now ensure that your mobile phones are set to silent, please, and I'll turn to our witnesses if you could introduce yourself, perhaps starting with Deputy Murray. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Deputy Bob Murray, Member of PNR. My name is Mark Degari. I'm the Head of the Public Service. Deputy Lyndon Trott, President of the Policy and Resources Committee. Deputy Heidi Soulsby, Vice President. Thank you. Right, uh, we're going to start with housing, perhaps unsurprisingly, and uh, first question, Deputy Trott. You recognised in your update statement last month that, there, quote, there was only a net increase of 94 units of accommodation in 2023 and that this is nothing short of a significant failure which cannot be allowed to continue. Given that in the last 10 years Guernsey has achieved an average of less than half of the typical 300 indicator when for most of the time finance was a lot less expensive, what gives you confidence that we can achieve it now? Well, firstly, thank you for the question, uh, uh, and I'm uh, genuinely delighted you've started with this because it is, in my view, uh, our number one domestic priority uh, and the view, I think, of uh, all of the members of the Policy and Resources Committee uh, and I think most members of the states. I, I've said um, previously that I have never witnessed quite so much resolve and determination from an assembly uh, to uh, get this right, to make this better, because I, th I think the situation we're in, where no one questions language like we've experienced market failure, uh, is because everyone knows that's precisely what has happened. We know that we've got to build uh, 800 or so uh, new properties to get us to a level of equilibrium, nothing more. And the... Uh, the determination that, that we as a committee uh, are showing um, uh, to bring forward the Leals Yard project is an example of something that can move the dial because Leals Yard uh, has the potential to, to produce 330 units of accommodation and the news uh, following the uh, institute decision on the institute which frees up the Cutlinchay site uh, has the, the, uh, the possibility of creating another 150, 170 units. So there could be 500 units on those two sites alone. Uh, so, yeah, so, to, so the, the, the short answer to your question is I've never seen so much determination. And if that determination is maintained and I see no reason for it not to be, uh, then I do think there's, there's light at the, the end of the tunnel. I think it's shining quite brightly as well. Are you concerned at the very, t very limited number of large building contractors on the island who are able to take on such infrastructure projects, uh, both from a capacity and a competitive point of view? Yes, I think it would be foolish uh, not uh, to view uh, that lack of capacity as a real concern. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why modular design is preferred uh, at Leal's Yard, uh, because it is less uh, on-island uh, capacity uh, um, uh, um, consumes, it requires less, less on island capacity because of the manner in which this modulated uh, 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 building, uh, buildings arrive in the island. They're, they're sort of prefabricated, if you like. Um, so that's one way, one way around it. Uh, but of course, the developers, who are often contractors as well, ha have made it quite clear to us that they will develop more sites um, if uh, GP11 uh, is removed. So uh, in my expectation is that the states uh, will do that in the near future and if that is the case uh, we'll be able to see if the assurance is given to us by those developer contractors um, is, is accurate. Can I go back to your qu first question yeah, if you don't mind? Well, you, you ask uh, why, why hasn't it happened in the past and why, what's going to change now? I think the ARP4 report made it very clear there's been complex market failure and I think 
um, having been in the States and tried to make change from when I was in my first term, it's because the States haven't wanted to do anything. They've thought market forces, that will sort everything out. And clearly it hasn't. And that report shows that the it's a com complex issue, but something that the States itself has to address. I mean, in my first time, tried to do something on first-time buyers, was told, oh, it would be inflationary. After that, um, the house prices were, went down and, um, and, no and nothing was done. And then you find in the ARC4 report saying, oh, we need to consider what we do to support first-time buyers. So I, um, forgive me my frustration in why we're where we are, but some of us have for quite a long time tried to say that that intervention was necessary. But I do think, I do think now that is understood. Um, I think there are, but we, we can't just say that it's one solution. I mean, we can talk about GP11, that, but that's, that, that's just one element of it. I think the ARC4 report, although it says a lot of what some of us already knew was happening anyway, is a really good starting point. And I wish we'd had that at the beginning of term. And then instead of various politicians having their ideas about how we should deal with, deal with things, we would, have a, we would have something set out in there, together with the, the strategic housing indicator, which shows that the properties that we really should be trying to build. Okay, uh, Deputy Trot, in your um, podcast that you recently did with the Guernsey Press, yeah. uh, you said that housing demand needs to better match supply and the committee has spoken a lot about their hopes for the supply side of things but what if anything do you think we can do to address the demand side of the equation it, well, uh, I, I think uh, demand um, is likely to remain uh, strong for many years to come uh, and in fact I think it's actually important that it does because uh, that demand is as much as anything else evidence of a strong economy and it's particularly uh, important uh, that uh, the community and business has confidence uh, in Guernsey uh, uh, in, in terms of what we offer as a place to, to live and work. Uh, and one of the ways that you maintain that confidence is to be able to reassure people that there is somewhere for them to stay should, should they want to come and uh, make their lives here. So I think demand will remain strong, at least, and, and in fact, I, I hope it will. But that podcast uh, produced a, a challenge or two because I didn't have the opportunity to elaborate on, on the point about affordability. It is accepted uh, by uh, the, uh, the global community that the measure of affordability is five times median earnings. Anything above five times median earnings is considered globally to be unaffordable. And the median amongst our competitor jurisdictions, Jersey as an outlier, is around 9, 10 or 11 times. So that's where most of the others are. But we're at 15 or 16 times, Jersey even higher. It's clearly not sustainable, but there are a, a number of different ways you can affect that. Uh, and one of them, of course, is uh, building uh, enough affordable houses at the bottom of the, of, of the, uh, the chain in order to help alleviate uh, that pressure. Uh, and, uh, and also, of course, raising median earnings, uh, which is another example, another product of a strong and prosperous economy. So that's why I issued that clarification, because uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted the community to be certain about my, my personal preferences, and, and that is a strong economy that deals with these matters. Uh, but one that also recognises that demand will, will remain strong, whether that's in the commercial sector or in the healthcare sector in particular, where, where much of the demand uh, for affordable housing uh, uh, emanates from. Can I add to that? Because we got some statistics from, from our pro a property unit that actually showed that um, the average size of Guern Guernsey property, yeah. they're 60% larger than properties in the UK. So larger properties, more expensive. If we can, and this is why probably the accountant in me came out when there was our headlines about all oh, reducing um, the average purchase price. Remember, this is we're talking about the purchase price. If we've got um, proportionately more bigger homes, that surely tells you something. It, we also know from the strategic housing indicator we need more smaller ho homes, two-bedroom, one, two-bedroom homes. Putting that right will help support bring down that average purchase price. That doesn't mean an individual's home will fall. And I think that was that, 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 that those, those headlines about all oh, wanting to see house prices fall is not what it was about. It's about 
average purchase price, by default, if we bring in and build, which is what we know we need, more affordable homes and more small, um, smaller homes, that average purchase price will go down. Yep. The, the, the volume will, will be there and will be, be meeting a need. But at the same time, it does not mean that people's homes that they're currently in will go down. I don't want that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure nobody around this, ta around this table does either. Thank you. I'll just take a moment to welcome Deputy Gollop to the panel. Um, Deputy Trot, at the last States meeting, you responded to a question from Deputy Kerapel about developing the Cattell Hospital site by stating that we should in, uh, instead concentrate on the Coutanche and Lille's Yard, which you've already said today. Given the constraints of current use and ownership at the Coutanche and the evident complexity of developing Lille's Yard has been shown over decades, really, um, and given that there's already a plan planning policy gateway under policies GP 16A and 16B and existing plans previously prepared by the GHA to develop the Cattell Hospital site for up to 97 units of affordable housing, how can you justify not looking to develop, as a matter of urgency, such a significant site that's already in public ownership? Well, I think it's, uh, this is a little bit like the field next to the PEH. Uh, the amount of, uh, of time it was going to consume uh, to uh, get that particular item through planning, and it was by no means certain that it would, uh, meant that it was time for prioritisation. And our view is that both Lille's Yard and the Coutanche site represent, uh, uh, you know, dial-moving uh, impacts on the housing market and should therefore be a priority. However, my personal view is I would raise the Cato Hospital site to the ground and I would use it as a, as a housing site in the future. I see no merit in preserving no architectural merit or, 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 or social merit in, in uh, preserving uh, an ex-mental um, uh, asylum. Um, but the, the answer to your question is, is a desire to, uh, to, to offer some, uh, to, to have real priorities. Uh, and I, I can give you a, a reasonable update on Leo's Yard if you want it now or you might want it later. Well, I think we do have a question in that, but okay. carry on with it now as okay. we're talking about it. Because the, the, the states are, are working with the developer of Eels, Eels Yard, which holds the options on the site, and it's important to remember that. They hold the options on the site, and not with the co-op, which owns the land. And the states are providing all professional support at its disposal and are funding an experienced and highly respected independent reviewer to ensure technical and financial risks associated with the project are mitigated and managed. And the progress of that review is fully dependent on the developer meeting the technical and commercial requirements. So the, the uh, developer has a, a, a number of hoops uh, that uh, they need to jump, jump through in order to satisfy ourselves that their, uh, their, their design is, is of the appropriate nature. Um, and that, the output of that review will be relied upon to complete commercial negotiations uh, and will inform uh, the recommendations that we bring to the states. On the basis of the current time frame and insurances from the developer on the availability of the technical, logistical and commercial material, and uh, barring any uh, unanticipated delays, the committee expects to be able to make its next public statement, give its next update on the matter by mid-June. Uh, which is only a couple of months away. Now, it, it will be challenging to bring proposals to the states before the summer break, uh, but that does remain the target because it's important to see a de demonstrable progress to start the regeneration of the bridge. And the committee has already used its delegated authority to agree that the Committee for the Environment and Infrastructure should progress uh, with enabling flood defence proposals uh, to protect not only this site but also the area under the control of the Guernsey Housing Association. I think that demonstrates we are doing everything in our power uh, to get this site going, uh, and we will apply precisely the same enthusiasm and rigour uh, to the site in the Coutanche. OK. I think the thing is, just coming back on the question, is that the Coutanche site obviously is dependent on the completion of the um, Guernsey Institute. So... That, and that's not going to be, uh, that's not scheduled to be finished for in excess of two years from now, um, which is why we're asking about the Cattell Hospital site, because there are a limited number of s sites that the states have control over that could yield up to 100 
units. Um, and so th this is the reason behind my question, notwithstanding the work that's being done on Leal's Yard. Of course, we are part, we're working with ESS and DNI in, in respect of that. But um, we understand some of the Coutanche could actually be built on without clear before the the rest of the site is cleared, so we can do that. But also, I um, think it was a government work plan. I don't. It might have been some other thing that we we ended up getting last year, but which covered off the housing plan in terms of other sites that could be ident that are identified that could be worked on. So you could add the Cateau. You could also add um, Frostard House, which is. Uh, one that I think really does have potential and for quite a large n number of um, units. So, yeah, we can add more and more. Um, I think from um, what we, we were told quite, uh, not forcefully, but clearly the, the other day about the, 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 the capacity of the staff to be able to look at every single site there is, there is going. But there is a plan and the states have agreed the sites that we should be looking at. And I think we are focusing on that, but we're also thinking perhaps Fossett House might be an even easier um, uh, one to get started than Catal Hospital. Okay. Yes, certainly. Because of hospital situation, there's three issues really that make it more challenging. The most important really is it's occupied. There are about 300 staff in there already, so we would have to decant them to another location or locations um, before you could do obviously anything in there. The second is obviously parts of the site have now been listed, which makes it a bit more challenging, not impossible, but a bit more challenging obviously to try to achieve things. And possibly Deputy Taylor probably clearer on this than I am. I believe it is just on the, on the edge of the urban development site, so we would have to extend things to some extent, is it not? If you uh, put in um, an application under policies GP 16A or B, well, yes, obviously, but it's it's not as, as straightforward if, as it were, perhaps, to, to just roll in there. So these are some of the challenges with that particular site that obviously put it a little bit further down the list. Not impossible to overcome, but obviously also challenging. Mm -hmm. And I understand, in terms of the listing, the GHA has actually prepared plans which retain the facade. I'm not aware of that, yeah. but yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got some data in front of me, which I think is already in the public domain, showing that um, there are uh, there are full permissions where work has not commenced um, uh, that uh, would account for 360 dwellings, uh, and there are 233 under construction, uh, which is 593. But the uh, disturbing uh, fact about that is only 26 uh, are affordable. In, in the, in the, under the definition, so you can see where the where the where the problem is. Um, uh, there seems to be adequate uh, de, uh, appetite, both in terms of well, particularly in terms of permissions for housing that falls outside of the affordable bracket, but with only 26 in the affordable bracket, and with the GHA's appetite uh, for development uh, being not quite as. Um, voracious as it once was, it, it does fall to the states to enable uh, projects um, from private developers for like like housing. like that at, at Leal's Yard yeah. in, in a way that uh, wasn't uh, the case uh, previously. I think, I think that brings me on very uh, neatly, in fact, to the next question, which um, is, Deputy Trotter, in the States last month, you said that you believe we should, and I quote, call the developers bluff yeah. um, by suspending policy GP11 for a period. Um, and obviously that's the affordable housing policy. And subsequently you lodged an amendment seeking to do that for a period of five years a, a, against Deputy Dykes Roquette. But don't you consider that to be um, an extraordinarily high risk and potentially expensive gamble to forego any affordable housing contribution from large private developments for such a long period of time? And are you confident that you can fund the full extent of the island's affordable housing needs for the rest of this decade if we're not relying on it to come from developments at all? Uh, the, uh, something had to be done. Uh, I mean, we're, 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 at, we're in a logjam position where the developers are saying that they're not developing these sites because of GP11. Um, uh, and I, I would rather see uh, more housing developed almost irrespective of its type um, uh, but I do, uh, and so do, the, does my committee, and indeed all of the committees directly involved in this, appreciate um, uh, that uh, the affordable housing side of things are where the challenges rest. I mean, for instance, we, we saw some information the other day that suggests that it's, quite, notwithstanding the point made earlier by Deputy Salisbury about the size of Guernsey properties relative to the, the, the equivalent property in the UK, 
that, that it is almost impossible to develop traditionally an affordable a house that would be deemed affordable for less than four hundred thousand pounds, which is about ten times median earnings. Um, so you know that's why we're looking at alternative, uh, and our colleagues in particular are looking at alternative uh, measures. We're, we're just doing everything we can to support the work that's being done by uh, ESS and E and I. Uh, uh, around different types of design, which is where this modular design you know, comes to the fore. But freeing up um, sites of 20 plus to come forward with no affordable housing contribution on them and no contribution at all from developers because it, you know, we know that developers have said they're prepared to pay a tariff, but your amendment, if successful, won't even in include that. So on that basis, do you think a period of five years suspension of this policy is not excessive? Um, because if nothing else, it may lead developers to thinking that there's no rush to bring those sites forward. Well, I think that there were many others within the Assembly who wanted that period to be the decade that you referred to earlier. But we held firm. We said that five years was enough to be able to see for certain whether or not the absence of GP11 had stimulated those smaller pockets of development. Do you know, I, I'm genuinely confident it will be because I've seen some of the, the numbers and I've just gave you a particular statistic that show that the excessive profits that some in our community believe that developers are making are, are not actually, because of the costs associated with the supply chain and the labour, um, are, are not as great as, as many think. And in fact, if we do progress Leal's Yard, uh, it'll be under a, 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 a I, I'm going to use the word quasi open book approach, but we will we will be able to see uh, uh, and share uh, in that information that is current, isn't it? The, uh, yeah. uh, which which um, will will uh, enable us to make sure that there isn't any excessive profiteering uh, and that the the desire to to make these properties as affordable as possible um, is maintained. But you do accept though by. Um, taking the 20 plus sites in private ownership out of any affordable housing contribution, that the likelihood is that if those state sites come forward, they will be for larger houses, which then works against your average price of a house. Well, not necessarily, because the, the, uh, the density and type of housing on those sites, of course, is a, is a matter for the, the DPA to uh, determine. Um, but I'll repeat the message I said earlier. I would rather have 20 houses, even if they were above the affordability threshold, which they probably will be, than not 20 houses. You know, the, there is a, uh, it, it's, it's this absolute market failure that has been such a problem for this community. Uh, and the building of, of any type of, of new accommodation will have a, an effect on the dynamics of the market, uh, uh, probably positively, because the issue is, uh, uh, a dearth of supply. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, I've already said I, I wouldn't want to see any particular uh, uh, reduction in demand, uh, and I don't anticipate any particular reduction in demand. But what, what I do know is, is that there are many within the, the. We always talk about affordable housing and, and social housing. We think we think of public sector workers, and, uh, and it's good that we should because you know, nurses are uh, extremely important uh, assets. However, our, our commercial uh, world. Uh, 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 is finding it uh, increasingly difficult to house its key staff. Uh, and that will, if left unchecked, eventually have an effect on our productivity and on our um, uh, economic performance. It, 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 our economic performance, which well, I'm sure we'll come to later, has been surprisingly strong, uh, and, and we anticipate that remaining, despite the fact that the cost of, the cost of housing is okay. so, it is so disproportionately to, high. Can I just Taylor. add before you do, go yes, on, I did say really, bearing, you know, this is not, um, if you like, that we haven't got availability of sites for social housing or affordable housing. We do. We just haven't been at this point in time been able to get sufficient people, so sufficient movement to make them move forward as quickly as we would want them to. So we do have a number of sites that obviously are ready to be developed, which primarily are with the GHA, who obviously are also looking at all the factors 
that are maybe preventing them at this point in time actually moving forward. So Can the I opportunity know, exists. We're talking about GPL, and I knew that you know, we get fixated, and I think that's a trouble. A lot of states members have got fixated with GP11 as if that be the, that that will result in everything. It would be fantastic, which I don't believe. Um, but it also shows how we think. Well, um, if we get rid of that, that means we won't have any um, affordable homes on those 20 plus units. But that's not necessarily the case. There are other there are other carrots and sticks that can be used, and I think that's why we need to. It is a complex area, and that's why I think the ARC4 report is, is very useful as giving us a direction of all the different sorts of interventions and work that we can do to, to move forward to, to the housing that we need. Um, so Guernsey has had a housing association, the GHA, uh, for just over two decades, uh, and during that time it's delivered uh, around 1,000 affordable homes. Uh, the current estimate is that we need around 1,000 1, more new affordable homes uh, by 2027. So it does PNR consider that there is a need for a second housing association or more uh, to complement the work of the GHA and increase capacity at this critical time? A couple of things based on that. One is that the GHA, if you like, have become a mature landlord. So they now have, as you just mentioned, a portfolio of properties which they actually, their business model has to sustain in terms of the income stream that they have, as well as build, obviously, as best they can afford. Um, so, obviously, they are reflecting and they, they have made it clear they have a 30-year plan that they're just putting the finishing touches to to try to organise how far and how fast they can actually move. But we're already working with other uh, providers in the marketplace at the moment on a couple of, pro of, of sites where we are doing a sort of joint venture type of situation. Um, and consequently, it, it certainly, you know, the door is open, I think, to anybody who can help at this point in time to actually move us forward, because I don't think the GHA realistically can achieve that kind of, within the time frame that perhaps we would like it to happen. Um, um, personal view, but not in our view, or probably in the accessory either, is I think there have been other people out there from here and elsewhere who would like to explore uh, and more than one housing association. In fact, technically, I used to live in Rosa Avenue. That's a different housing association, very niche, Housing 21, uh, uh, in the UK that does work for older people. I think that the point is often made that Guernsey is actually subscale for one housing organisation, but then we're subscale in so many other areas, uh, and we have to live with that. And I think maybe a degree of, um, not competition exactly, but housing associations that provided different products for different markets might, might be useful. Um, I agree with Heidi that Crossroad House provides housing opportunities, so does the Cattell Hospital and the King Edward Hospital. And to me, the fact that it's listed, and I agree with the listing, albeit not the way it was done, um, provides opportunities uh, for more private sector housing, because to me, if you provide more first-time buyers and accommodation for people downsizing, but especially, as Lyndon said, for those working in the commercial sector, you not only benefit our economy, but you also free up other properties for key workers and those are perhaps on more restricted incomes. So I don't see our mission as just doing affordable housing or housing associations per se. I see there as potential out there to take on sites like the King Edward and the Cato when it's cleared. Bob makes the point it's still full, which it, uh, I think we could free those sites up as quickly as possible, but not just for social and affordable housing, but for housing above that level. Just, just to be clear, that site is already under discussion with um, one of the providers for care homes at the moment, um, and we've extended, and as far as I'm aware at the moment, actually, they're motoring along quite well with that. So, as John was saying, other alternatives that we require, like care homes, which we are going to need, obviously, a lot more of, that's a, a perfect site for that. I, I wouldn't hesitate to, to answer your question directly. I, I would have uh, an additional housing association. I think the skills associated with development are not unrelated, um, but um, there are differences to those uh, required with the maintenance and consolidation of a, of a, a housing book. Um, and uh, the uh, and I would make it uh, I, I I wouldn't hesitate in having having two. I don't think competition is a bad thing. Uh, I think it keeps uh, people's pencils sharp. At least it should. 
uh, and uh, and I think um, it, it's, um, it's, it's I think it's overdue. I, I, I'd, I'd set about doing that um, uh, uh, too sweet. I think it's fine, but are we just going to replicate what we've got at the moment? I, I, I would question that, and you know we don't want to if we've got two and everything that it be just um, multiplying costs. By if we're replicating what we've got at the moment, might be um, uh, as uh, it's been said before, focusing on different aspects yes. of. Of housing, not not just focused on one area. Um, we talk about, and I was that's something I thought I, I, about key <coughs> workers, and I really don't. There's been a lot, lot of talk about that. I don't people under, really understand what key worker housing is. Um, it, it's, we talk about needing it, but not understanding which key workers are talking about. I mean, I know from COVID that if, if the people that we might think are key are, are, might not be the same people who end up being absolutely essential when, when push comes to shove. So we've got to be, we've got to be very careful on that. And, and But a lot of um, mix-up when it comes to key workers, are they agency staff? Or are they permanent staff and people that we want on the island and we want to keep on the island, our local people? And I am concerned that a lot, and this happened with the PH field, I think. It was all about, well, we need the nursing here, we, we need them on site. But at the end of the day, that was for agency staff. We can't see families, and most nurses who are qu come qualified, they're, they're married or they're with partners and they've got children. Being in a small little flat in, on the PH site would not, would not be convenient. We're talking about agency um, staff. We don't want to be spending millions and millions and millions of pounds on people who are, mm -hmm. who are coming and, and will, be, will be going quite frequently, and in an area which wasn't a huge issue before COVID. Um, before COVID, we brought down the number of um, agency staff we needed. It has become a big issue since COVID, but I think that is reflective of the whole pandemic. A lot of um, people in the health services had a really torrid time in, in the UK. A lot of them thought, right, no, I'm just going to go out, I'm going to be, be an agency staff, make a lot of money at once, and, and, and that, that was fine, just get away from it all. But after a while, they find that, yeah, they've had a nice increase in, in, in the salary, but there's no security of tenure, there's no pension, there's no paid holidays. And I think of, over time that that will change and there'll be that, that, mm -hmm. that pool of agency that, relative to permanent staff will reduce. So, so I, what I, where I'm getting to in this, we are this focus on what we call key workers has been mixed up. We've got key workers, we've got locally people here now who can't afford housing who are key workers, and we've got agency staff. And for me, we need to look at them differently and say what would best suit them. We've got, I mean, there's, there's things like something I'm interested in is the whole idea of micro housing, um, basically ready to, ready to plonk down on, yeah. on a site. They're, they're, they're ready built plug and, plug and play, which would really suit us now where we've got that requirement and then maybe less so um, in the future. But they are like an, considerably cheaper. They, they'll, they'll do, do, do the business now and then we can focus on the building that we need for our, for our people, our local people here and for people that we need, we're going to need on a, on a more permanent basis because it's, it's better for the community to have people who are invested in the community um, who are providing those, those services. And so that's the area that so I'm, that I'm trying to say is we talk about key worker housing and it's just gone off in, in, and it's just a frustration of mine that we don't really, well, we haven't even got a definition of it at the moment anyway. So that it's, it's one of those areas that we really need to think carefully Can about. Bring it back to the question with um, Deputy Troy, you said you'd be interested in a, a second housing association, possibly with a slightly different remit. Yeah. Is that something that PNR is going to do any work on? I think it, that's a, a matter that falls to the uh, committee for ESS. I, I'm aware that Deputy Roffey uh, ha has some thoughts around this, um, but it's certainly something that I would I would personally support. Okay. Uh, Can I come and back to Deputy Taylor because we we are. I you, think we need to keep a little keep, bit keep of a move going, on here. This is a short statistic. I'm okay. sure you won't mind it because Deputy Taylor reminded us that the GH, GHA has been responsible for building uh, 1,000 affordable homes, but despite that. Private rental prices in 2021, the average rent was £1,817 some three years ago, which was 56.2% of median earnings. That's twice what ARC 4 consider sustainable. So, so where median house prices are three times what is considered sustainable, rents in the private sector are already twice what is um, considered sustainable. You probably knew that, but I thought that was an interesting fact. Um, so, 
The Guernsey Housing Plan was published last October. Uh, does PNR support all the aims put forward within the plan, and is the committee fully committed to resourcing them? Certainly, Deputy Trot and myself both meet with uh, Deputy De Samurai, who is uh, President of ENI, responsibility for housing uh, policy, and um, Deputy Roffey as President of ESS. And we go through the plan, uh, it's also scheduled out, um, and we're supporting them. There is a lot on there, and I think that what we need to do is make sure we are focused on the key areas which will give us a be best return to, to start with. I think I've got one member of staff a bit behind us who is absolutely attuned to this, and it's her bread and butter. In fact, I think she wakes up in the morning, and this is her her, 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 her big job. So absolutely, we, we, we are committed to that plan. Well, certainly, I mean, it's something I, I think, yeah, we've, got, we've just got to do it, and that's what we're, we're aiming to do and seeing how we can work together to make it happen. Yeah, Appendix 11 of the GWP is the annual monitoring report, one of the recovery actions with an end date of December 2023, which is to examine the options for provision of state-sponsored mortgages, loans and financing options for deposits and purchases of properties available under a scheme aimed at promoting and facilitating home ownership. Could you tell us what the current status of that work stream is, please? Yeah. No, no, that has not been uh, progressed at this stage. Um, but there's an interesting segue from that question, from the, the previous question. I, I hadn't appreciated uh, that there is nothing, and I'm grateful to the staff for this, there's nothing to stop a housing association setting up now. Of course, there's nothing in, in law that says uh, competition is denied. The challenge would be uh, uh, providing uh, and procuring the capital. Uh, and that's really the same problem uh, with regards to any type of um, state's involvement with a, a mortgage scheme. Uh, it, is the, it is the provision of capital. But it is part, it is in the housing plan as well. But the focus on the whole, as I said, we're not doing everything all at once. We can't. I mean, you, you need to see the schedule that's, that, that's ongoing. On, you do, we literally have not got the people to do it. And we've got to focus on that. Well, we really are focusing on the supply side first. So that's why it's not being one of those things we're adding to well, the. I suppose that's why the question's already been asked is, is PR committed to providing the resources to make sure that all of these work streams get done? We are, but you can't do everything at once. And I think that's the trouble. The states like to think it can do everything at once and says we haven't got the resources. But really, we're going to blow a gasket anytime soon by the number of things that, we're, that are being expected to be done. I mean, we, 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 I mean I, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get on to the cost of... Um, uh, public Services um, uh, Savings Committee. In there, I mean, it's from, through that exercise, absolutely amazed by the number of work streams already ongoing that related to a lot of the ideas that have come through from, from the public and others. And really, there's a lot of people running around trying to do a lot, and it means that stuff cannot get finished because they're going from pillar to post, one thing to another. So the idea is to focus, and we're focusing on the supply side first. Yes. I did a lot of work years ago, I was on the tail end of it, of looking at alternative models for mortgages and things. But it's a very large work stream, and the risk and why they disappeared from the good old days of advisory and finance when we had them was because they, if they're not done properly, then they just funnel the market and make it more and more expensive. So that those considerations there... And you mentioned Lisa, who's behind us, busy with other things. Lisa serves at least three, if not four, committees. We have a shortage of, of skilled policy workers, and, and, and that in itself is a resource. Um, and back to the housing associations, one area I'd like to see is perhaps a new entrant in the field, not just with key worker housing, which is done, but maybe elderly. Well, that would, 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 would perhaps combine an element of care and an element of housing, and coming out of that would be freeing up other property. So it would have more than one benefit. But again, it's not going to be achieved this year. To be fair, Simon. I think we need to be careful we don't get carried away here. I mean, the states can put any number of policies in place to try to help, and, and we are doing. You're still talking about the capacity of the labour market to be able to build. And you also have to accept that you know, a contractor or, or a, a developer or a builder has to make money from whatever they build. Now, obviously, we can make it easier for people to get on the ladder by providing some assistance financially, whatever it's going to be. But the problem really at the moment is that capacity in the marketplace. It is stretched. 
And I think just recently, in fact, I think we saw one of the local developers basically suggesting why would they want to take risks at this point when the market is so red hot, where they've got guaranteed work and so forth. So even though we can do our best to try to make it possible for people to purchase or to buy or to rent, you still actually have to, I mean, we know the capacity, we haven't got enough actual properties in all those categories. You still actually have to have a market that is able, a labor market, to fulfill. And we can't push that harder because unfortunately, as we all know since Brexit, our normal routes of bringing in additional you know, capacity to help us publish builders, whatever it might be, is now denied us. So we can't get you know, fleets of builders coming in to be able to add to the current availability of local labour to build the additional capacity that we want. So it's a two-way street, unfortunately. I mean, obviously, the state is doing as best it can. More affordable housing, more one- to two-bedroom homes um, that, that people can more, more readily um, afford, even though, as, as Lyndon quite rightly said, it's still really expensive to, to build here, and the construction costs are, are considerably more than the UK. Thank you. I'm keen to move on, because we do have a, a lot of ground to cover. I'd like to uh, move on to an investments and the returns on the state's investments undeniably play a significant role in the overall health of the state's financial position. And as such, uh, the Scrutiny Management Committee is launching a full review. However, regarding last year's performance, we note that the investment return was $34.2 million from invested reserves. Uh, Deputy Trot, as someone with considerable experience of investments, and money markets generally. Can you inform us what percentage rate the entire investment portfolio returned during 2022 and 2023 and how this compares to appropriate market benchmarks and or other jurisdictions? I'm not sure whether I have that uh, particular information to hand. Just bear, bear with me a moment. Do we, can, we just, can we determine that from the schedule? I'm not sure we can. Yeah. Bottom right, but we don't have comparable to 2022. Okay, thank you. So we don't, I don't have the, the, the information for 2022 in front of me, Simon, which was a particularly uh, challenging year, as you know. But for 2023, uh, it was 7.2%. Um, now, um, I've only been on the state's investment board uh, as an observer uh, since uh, really the start of this year. Uh, <clears throat> I was, you know, I've got this job, as you know, mid-December. Mid uh, uh, and during that period, um, I, I've learned a few things that I wasn't aware of before, including the fact that there was a, a very material restructuring of the portfolio during 2023, um, uh, which um, saw some disinvestment from certain uh, um, uh, asset types uh, uh, and a, a re-sort a re of priority and reprofiling of others. Um, and I know that there are some out there who think that, that, uh, that the change in the, in the component parts of the portfolio uh, impacted negatively on, on performance. Um, I, I think that's, that it, it's difficult to prove that either way. But what we do know is, and I've used this in the States, so I won't be afraid to use it here, is that one particular index, uh, the MSCI, uh, returned uh, over double at what this portfolio returned. Uh, but that's not in itself a, a, fair, uh, a fair comparator. Um, uh, but I th it, and, and I think uh, those who have been members of the State's Investment Board longer than I, uh, well, I'm not actually a member, I'm an observer, that's an important distinction, uh, will, uh, will tell you uh, that they think that the performance would not have been as good uh, a 7.2% in 2023 under the previous uh, portfolio makeup. I've no way of proving or denying that because I haven't got the data in front of me. Uh, so that's about as good an answer as I can, so as I can confident give. confident are you following the restructuring that yeah. you can return to higher levels of return? Um, well, on the grounds that the... Uh, the, ben the benchmarks are, are a premium. Is it to RPI or CPI? CPI. CPI. It's, C it's a CPI plus uh, mechanism. Uh, and on the grounds that, that um, inflation is falling, um, it, is, it is possible that in percentage terms the performance uh, would be less than 7.2% next year. But the, what makes that question so difficult is so many different factors uh, can 
uh, affect that. For instance, if there was a very, very rapid reduction or uh, uh, focus on monetary policy, which saw interest rates fall very rapidly around the world, uh, then I would expect equity markets to perform very strongly on the back of that, uh, and the performance could easily be, you know, well into double into double digits, uh, not, uh, notwithstanding that that, um, uh, that you know the, the portfolio is very varied. So it is it is very it is very difficult. But I can see why some observers believe that performance isn't as good as they would have wished it to be. Uh, but I think, in, li in line with the, the criteria set, um, it was it was reasonable. I understand that the move into private equity under the new advisors means a reduction in available liquidity of assets. Do you consider that to be a potential issue? Um, well, you can all you can, with, with a portfolio of this nature, you can create liquidity quite quickly, particularly. Uh, the, the, those that are invested in, you know, in bonds, where where where, where liquidity exists in, in those particular markets, you can, you know, turn those things into cash in very quick order. So no, no, I don't. I, I need to make make clear that what, 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 <laughs> while I've got some uh, significant commercial interests in people who are in a business that has uh, some genuine experts working for them, I'm not actually qualified to give investment advice. So uh, uh, my, the, with the, the language that I'm using is as, a, uh, as a, an interested observer uh, rather than anyone who's, who's um, willing or able to give the sort of advice that maybe uh, if Cambridge Associates, for instance, the advisors in front of, were in front of you today, uh, they would give a much more technical explanation. But there is, I mean, it's always about a balance. A portfolio will have private equity, but it will also have other investments to compensate for that. And the advisors are meant to follow the strategy set by, um, the current strategy set by um, previous PNR. So, and that will, that does include making sure that we've got that balance between uh, uh, liquidity and, and knowing that we're in areas where we'll get a really good return. It, that's the sort of area that, you know, the scrutiny re review will probably have a look into. If I could just finish this section with, with a more general question, if you like, and I appreciate it's relatively early days in terms of your sitting on that board. Do you have any concerns regarding the effectiveness and functioning of the state's investment board? Um... Well, while I'm buying myself a little bit of thinking time, the amount of cash in the portfolio at the end of last year was just over £50 million. So there's always some sort of built-in liquidity, notwithstanding the answer I gave earlier. Uh, I, um, I'm not um, uh, in any way... Uh, 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 I do not wish this to sound in any way um, as if I have any issues with the current members of the State's Investment Board. I do not. Uh, but I do have a strong view that we don't pay them enough. Uh, I, I think we, we've, we've had, we found it surprisingly difficult to recruit what I would regard as uh, absolute top draw candidates. We've had some good candidates, I hasten to add, apply. Um, uh, but I, I can't help thinking that uh, paying uh, the sorts of fees that we are, which I think is about £8,000 a year or thereabouts, when a, a, a normal director sitting on, on a, uh, an unlisted uh, investment vehicle uh, looking after assets of three billion would, would expect to earn somewhere between 20 and, uh, and 50,000. Um, I do think it kind of puts off some of the, the, better, uh, the better candidates. Uh, but, but I also think that, that it sends out the wrong message um, because uh, it, it almost gives the impression uh, that this isn't a, a really important oversight role, because it is. Well, whilst the advisors uh, that we, that the investment advisors, are, are of the highest um, national and international reputation, being able to challenge them effectively is re is a really important part of this role. And um, I, I don't know, but I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to pay them a, a market rate uh, 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 and see you know, what, if any, effect that had on the type of people that were prepared to undertake this role. Thank it's, you. It's, it's very much considered a public service at the moment, uh, and, and I'm not necessarily certain that's the right way forward. Yeah, I won't want to go back to where we just we had politicians to start, um, doing the oversight, which we had before. I mean, that, I, mean I, I know that there were those who did sit on, in that capacity found it uncomfortable, especially if they did have no investment um, or financial background. I'd like to move on to the uh, state's capital portfolio, and uh, I'd like to address some questions to the head of public service, Mr. Degari. Um, 
In last month's states meeting, in, res in response to a question from Deputy St Pierre, Deputy Trott stated that you will be conducting an independent review into the governance of major capital projects. And then we saw a follow-up article in Bailiwick Express, and that revealed or was reported that the review will cost uh, uh, less than £5,000 and it's been undertaken by an independent external reviewer. Could you tell me who that independent external reviewer is or will be and how they're qualified for that position? Certainly. The, <clears throat> the reviewer is um, Mr Martin Thornton, who is a, 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 a former... Uh, uh, leading lawyer locally with a lot of local contract law um, experience um, and a lot of experience of very large capital projects um, that have been um, commissioned and undertaken by the states of Guernsey over over many uh, previous years. Um, the, he has a good working knowledge um, of um, our processes and procedures um, and uh, that, that's actually why I selected um, him to, to, to look at it um, from a completely objective uh, perspective because if you look at our governance processes, um, they follow very closely the, um, the, the technical models of Prince methodology and, and of you know, the traditional UK government approach. Um, but there is clearly something wrong in that we have all of this process um, but I'm concerned that it's, despite that it's not effective. So what he's looking at is, is how can we make this uh, more effective. I, would, I must also say that um, irrespective of whatever governance is, uh, models one has in place, um, if there are human failings from time to time, um, there will always be those. Um, obviously, the purpose of those governance models is to mitigate that uh, to, you know, as much as you possibly can. But I, I, I have worked um, with Mr Thornton before on a number of, of, of other issues, and he is, he is, he's excellent. Uh, he's very thorough. Uh, he's completely independent, um, and, and uh, he anticipates providing committee an interim um, uh, update on his findings by the end of this calendar month. So, uh, if you ask the man in the, in the street uh, and you put lawyer and five thousand pounds together, that uh, doesn't seem to buy you much uh, much of his time. So, how in depth will the review be? It's going to be very much in depth. Um, um, Mr. Thornton um, is a very special person indeed, in terms of he feels quite genuinely a, a great sense of. Um, wanting to give back to the community um, and he is not charging commercial rates and um, uh, and he wants to make a contribution um, to the community and th that is his motivation to make a difference for the betterment of the government. Okay, so clearly you're going to have some terms of reference for the review. Um, will they be published, made public? Um, I haven't discussed that um, with committee. Committee have seen them and agreed them but I see no reason why committee would not uh, wish those to be published in due course. Okay, that's encouraging. Thank you. Who set the terms of reference, incidentally, Mr. Degari? They, they were first penned by myself and then um, presented uh, to committee for any additional comments they, 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 they had. I uh, actually modified them uh, following the state's debate a couple of weeks ago uh, because the, the focus that I'd originally set um, was emphasised, was, was placed in, in one particular area, but we used the state's debate and, and the frustrations that we heard members raising to actually expand them um, so that it would, it would meet um, political expectations. Can, can you please explain the role of PNR in respect of capital projects for the proposed phase two hospital development? Well, th that's a very, very important question and, and, and a point um, that does need better understanding by, by many. Um, PNR um, support investment decisions, and that's it. Uh, in terms of the, the the mandate for this project, sits fully with the committee uh, for health and social care. So PNR support the principal committees um, take forward their capital projects, but the role the role of, of, of PNR is is one to uh, support the investment making decision process. Okay, so, so in terms of of ultimate responsibility for a capital project, who holds that responsibility? 
that, in my view, rests with the senior responsible officer within the principal committee area, and it's the politicians of that principal committee that should hold that senior responsible officer to account. And, and which political member um, of the committee is, is responsible for this area, or is it something that gets reported to the wider committee? It, actually, as far as the hospital is concerned at the moment, because there's two projects complementing, you have the, obviously the um, uh, EPR as well, which is fundamental to the success, if you like, of the business case for OHM2, because it will improve productivity and so on and so forth, and that's been built into it. Um, because we now have the portfolio board set up for these, um, to try to find a sustainable model, obviously, for health, what we've come to the conclusion is that really PNR should have a, you know, a, a responsibility on either of those. So it, Deputy um, Soulsby is actually our kind of you know, over, oversight on the OHM2, and I'm on the um, e EPR. Um, and, and obviously we meet with certainly the rest of the board, of which Mark is actually a member, um, on, a, on a fortnightly basis to try to monitor exactly where we've got. What I would say in, in, in terms of your original question, Simon, is that there, are, there have been different approaches. So from a TEP perspective, which I'm much more familiar with, we decided from the outset that we would in, invite a member of PNR onto the TEP board, really just to keep them abreast of where, obviously, the, the, the evolution of the project was going. Um, and it, it's no criticism, but that's not the, what the approach that was taken um, with, with, obviously, the, the, the HSC. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, both have, have got merit, um, but we took the view that it's probably best to keep PNR abreast of what was going on um, rather than to sort of come back to them periodically. I think it's yeah. a bit different because the, the TP is um, the transformation programme in total. HSC did have that. I mean, in fact, the head of the transformation who, who ran that at HSC when I was there, who's it's a person who got nabbed by education and is now running the education transformation. I don't know what happened to that, but I have heard people say, you need a politician on the project board of the, the capital project board. Well, unless they are a quantity, well, not a structural engineer or they've got any re any rel uh, rel relative important right professional skill i mean even an accountant might be helpful looking looking at the numbers i i don't no well but they'll actually find out where the numbers might, might have been missing but yeah. the, but the the, the real issue here, I, I don't think all that. All, it's, it's been a bit of a red herring. Who should sit on a uh, on a board? I don't. I don't think they should be on. The, need to be on the capital project board. What I do think, and is one of the areas uh, in this is an, an issue, is not having a chief officer at HSC. I think that the ultimate person who has responsibility on what is a huge, huge committee. I, I, I said it at the time when it was when they changed everything last term, and I still stand by it. And I think this has shown it how getting rid of the chief officer at HSC has been a contributory factor because that person will be overall responsible for that that um, committee, um, directly answerable and responsible to that committee, and the SRO should be somebody who would be reporting directly to to that to that person so i think i think that is an issue but i also think the other main big, big issue on this was phase two never went back to the states the original intention back when we the policy letter was brought to the states phase one was in detail phase two we always said that is totally indicative we have no real idea because it was going to be five six years hence and certainly you've seen everything change and in, in terms of cost of build um being able to everything since COVID, it's changing. But I do think if that um, pol if a policy letter had been written to come back to the states last year, that the issue that has arisen um, would well have been identified. Because somebody said Reba took stage two, Reba stage three. Somebody would say, "Oh no, we're not looking at stage three. Our numbers are stage two. I mean, we'd be able to put, join all the dots because there's nothing more than having a policy letter that focuses the mind about what, what what is actually going on. So for me, those are the those are the key points. I don't think any politician, unless they're a mind reader, would be able to see into somebody's head to know what. They, they hadn't told them. I, I don't want to preempt the review that's going to, to, to happen, but should a senior member of staff in PNR not have known what was going on? I mean, surely someone must have requested an update on progress from February 23 to October 23. To October 23. That, I mean, on the one hand, uh, we're being told that this is the failing of um, 
two or three individuals. On the other hand, there's a very different view that this is a structural failing of the project boards, etc., are set up. I think there's a couple of contributory things here that actually unfortunately came together and exacerbated the damage. And the first was that the original SRO actually left quite early in the project. Um, and that, of course, left a gap. And almost, almost immediately afterwards, because the previous PNR decided that they would hold all of the capital projects until we'd done some work to try to prioritise them, it actually was taken as just stop. So the meetings that would ordinarily be happening on a regular basis, A, there was an SRO missing at that stage and hadn't been replaced. It wasn't until, I think it was May or something, that actually that came into place. But the financial implications, if you like, were not being monitored even though it was really just phase one at that stage that was obviously on, 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 on process. So it, there was a combination of factors that actually meant that it was an extended period of time before it was highlighted, because once we brought in a new, well, HSC brought in a new SRO, they themselves had to become acquainted, obviously, with the backdrop. So it, it, it actually extended the period that ordinarily that wouldn't necessarily have been the case. OK, so, I mean, it, it sounds like a combination of factors... And uh, again, I, I'm, I'm, I want to hand over in a second, but are, will all of these areas be explored under the review and, and recommendations made? Yes. We, we've heard... Uh, I've got another question around capital project and OHM2. Um, we've heard that there's likely going to be a need for, a, for an increase, and if that state's approved for the tens of millions on OHM2 for the hospital redevelopment, Will the whole portfolio need to be reprioritised? I think there is a question mark over whether we'd have to borrow mon more money, um, if it was to the extent that obviously we're looking at at this point in time. Um, and that, of course, would have to go back to the States if that was the case. I think it'll go back to the States, whatever happens, to be perfectly honest, once we've done, or HSC have done, you know, the necessary groundwork to find out where we are. And it could take six months. I mean, they've been given three to six months, or they've asked for that, to be able to do this work. Um, so in that three to six months, there will be a natural price increase, unfortunately, because that's the kind of inflation that we're heading with, dealing with at the moment. But um, one of the mitigating opportunities may be, and it's far too early to say, is whether the scope can be changed to try to keep it within the original sort of budget frame that we were looking at. Um, I don't think that's off the table. I think they're being very open in saying we will look at every possibility. It has become clearly far more than just a value engineering situation because there is no way that value engineering would knock that sort of money off of the project. So it may possibly be a question of scope or it may be a question of extending the time over which obviously we're able to, to fund it. Originally it was three phases. And then, and I think that's why. I mean, I, I, then it was it was your uh, scrutiny hearing with HSC last year. Uh, I think it's on the public record. I thought because they changed the phases from from just from three to two, I think that that should have it, it was a different project. But as a result of that, and I I think it was important. It's, that's just a forum where we need to think it through and understand. You know, oh, is the approach right? And it might well be that that rephasing needs to happen again. Phases two and three combined were less than fifty million pounds, yeah. and we're now talking over one hundred and fifty million pounds. I get pounds. that, and, and um, but at the same time, t prices have gone up considerably. You know how um, not three times in five years. It depends on what projects they are, and some some things were were indicative. But yeah, I agree. We it needs to be looked at in terms of has there been mission creep. Mm -hmm. um, some things that are in there, I, I wonder whether are, should they be the priority or not. And I think that that is clear. I mean, I have heard some stories about things that were included that, that you, you would question. I think HSC themselves have, have knocked back um, some areas. The one thing that is absolute that, that astounds me, and perhaps this is something we'll pick up um, as part, part of this review, is the proportion of non-construction costs in these huge projects. So, say, I mean, see how many millions have been spent on education without any anything any um, spades in the ground. Um, yeah, there have been spades in the ground at the hospital, but still, there's millions that get that get spent way before anything is actually built. It's, the, those, it's those non-construction, the consultant costs that we, we seem to need um, and the, the time that it takes to, to bring those people on board that really adds to the cost of these projects nowadays. It, it's, not the, it's not actually the construction of the thing. That's, that's a more straightforward. It's, it's understanding that you've got all these property managers, um, architects, people that support the architects. It's, it, it's massive. Absolutely. Yeah, there is a, you know, there's a portfolio project team with all of these larger projects 
comprising primarily internal resources, but also we're necessary specialist external, and they certainly aren't cheap. Um, but there is, you know, you, you do need, in terms of good governance of some of these projects, you do need to have relative skills in there challenging. And, of course, on top of that, we have external consultants for assurance purposes or quality surveyors, quantity surveyors, who actually obviously are, are giving us an indication. And it is, you know, to, to be quite fair, it isn't until we get to tender process that we know that all of the preparatory work that we've done is going to come in anywhere near the kind of budget that's been set for it. So to be fair to HSC, we haven't lost 30 million at this stage because we didn't spend it. But we would potentially, obviously, if the project came to fruition under those circumstances. But it could be worse than that by the time you get to tender. Mm -hmm. So we need to be aware of that. But this inflation has been huge, absolutely huge. And it is no question that we do not have enough sufficient project management skills on board for the portfolio that we've actually got to deal with. We are developing that and we will get better prices because if you have to go to the market, it's very, very expensive to actually bring these kinds of skills in. They're very worthwhile, but in the absence of them, if you haven't got them, you've got no choice. So that does push the cost up quite considerably. Okay, one more question and then we'll take a short break. It leads me on to the, my next question. So on the subject of project costs in the portfolio, specifically Deputy Trot, is your committee confident that the Alderney Airport project will still be delivered within the approved £24.1 million cost envelope? No, it's not. <laughs> will it be coming back to the States or will it, will it be coming back at all? Well, uh, this, this is obviously is a matter for the States um, Trading Supervisory Board who are leading on this. Uh, I've made my position clear, uh, Adrian, that I think um, this is a matter that should come back to the States. Um, uh, but uh, the States Trading Supervisory Board are undergoing uh, discussions uh, at this time. So it would be, it would be, I think, you know, it would be wrong to um, uh, to say any more. But I, I will add something to the previous question you asked. We, we have been made aware uh, that there was some uh, potential overspecification. Uh, on the hospital uh, uh, by someone who knows what they're talking about uh, uh, and as a consequence we do think that there will be some benefit from the value engineering exercises being undertaken to what to what extent no one can tell and, and w whether it remains affordable or not depends on a number of things including of course the performance of the economy the performance of the investment portfolio and so on and so on so it's one of those questions that's entirely appropriate to ask uh, but almost impossible to give an accurate answer to um, very much might reflect a review of the full business case because obviously that was that was developed with the particular you know parameters in mind if those parameters change considerably then one may have to go back to the business case to see whether or not we can actually you know sustain that approach in the way that it is so for example on the OHM2 quite a lot of um, hope has been put behind developing the private sector or, or capability of the private sector to be able to utilise that, maybe bringing people in from the UK or preventing people having to go to the UK. Um, but obviously if the cost of providing that changes, if those parameters change, maybe you have to reassess exactly the value of that part of the portfolio. Okay. We'll take a short break now, thank you, and reconvene sharp at quarter to four.
Okay, thank you. Uh, so the financial position now. Um, Deputy Trott, you s recently stated that if you had your way, you would test the appetite of the states for a two pence income tax increase. If you fail to persuade your committee that this is the solution to the deficit, do you instead intend to bring that proposal forward personally by means of an amendment or raquette? No, I, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't go against my committee's uh, wishes. Um, I, I, and, al and also, of course, it, it would. It depends, um, not exclusively, but primarily on what the economic conditions uh, look like uh, at the time leading up to the budget, and, and indeed what the forecast future has looked like. But I think reference to two percent. Uh, on the, the uh, basic rate of personal income tax has been useful in a number of ways. Uh, not only has it, has it continued to expand the narrative around the fact that we can't live in a dream world. We, we simply, we're running, we're running a deficit. It, it remains a structural deficit uh, and it does need to be addressed. Uh, notwithstanding some very good news that we've had, both in terms of um, uh, ETI performing better than we'd expected and, of course, the news around Pillar 2, uh, which I think um, is pleasing uh, for everybody. Uh, but we had a structural deficit last year, 2023, uh, that equates, not precisely, but more or less, uh, to uh, uh, the, the extra, an extra two pence uh, uh, on the basic rate, 2% on the basic rate of personal income tax would have eradicated that deficit pretty much, so we would have uh, ended uh, on, at a flat position. So it enables people to visualise the extent of the historical uh, uh, issues. Uh, but to answer your question specifically, I would not do anything unilaterally, uh, and it's quite right in my view that PNR has reached a decision on whether to bring that forward as a budget proposal yet, because a lot can happen between now and when the budget is uh, finalised uh, during, the, during the late summer. So you are saying that there, there is a possibility, at the very least, that um, that might be a proposal we could expect to see as part of the budget? I think it's a possibility, uh, but I, uh, it's by no means a probability, and I wouldn't put it any stronger than a possibility. Okay. And for at least a decade now, successive senior committees have been warning of the pressing need to diversify the tax base away from personal income tax. Is that no longer a priority, or do you consider that ultimately GST is unavoidable? No, I don't think uh, GST is unavoidable. Um, and and I have I've never been that particularly I've never personally I've never been that bothered about the concentration that we have on ETI because I've said on, on a number of occasions uh, that the tax that we raise uh, from salaries has kept our focus uh, on the employment market laser like uh, throughout my time in public office. Uh, Sixty five percent I think or thereabouts come from uh, personal taxes, but. Um, the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an existing tax, it's an effective tax, it's a tax that people understand. There's lots of benefits, um, but the states has tested its appetite for this state's for a, a, a broad-based consumption tax on a number of occasions has rejected it because we don't, know, we don't know what the next states would do. But let's say, for instance, this state did decide to raise the personal rate of, of, of uh, income tax. Um, it can always uh, 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 dial it back uh, to where it is or lower uh, should a future state decide on a new form of tax like a goods and services tax. So, you know, nothing's forever. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's important that we remain agile and nimble and we, we change uh, uh, fiscal policy to reflect the conditions um, that are prevailing at the time. Uh, and the conditions at the moment are that this political body will not approve a goods and services tax, and therefore it's, um, uh, it's not irresponsible to consider, the, consider other options. OK. Um, you recently highlighted that eight out of ten suggestions put forward to the committee by the public last year revolved around raising taxes and charges, um, and you claimed that this means that most people know that they're not taxed enough. Would you accept that an alternative interpretation might be that the survey was done in the wake of a very high-profile debate on GST, and it was the fear of GST that made people suggest a variety of mostly minor ways of raising revenue, possibly even in ways that did not affect them personally? Yes, I think that, I think that is, is quite likely. Uh, I mean, the point I was trying to make is, is that in terms of, of value, in terms of the proposals that came forward, in terms of value, 
uh, the, the the focus was was very much on you know stuff that moved the dial was very, was very much on the, the the tax raising and the fee raising side of it, as opposed to material uh, efficiencies uh, that were identified by the community. Um, but I, I take your point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but personally, the conversations that I have are the majority, not all, are that the, the community recognises that that we're not we're not raising enough income now lots of people think others should pay of course um but i think most people uh, fundamentally uh, understand uh, that the deficit is real uh, and it's not as a consequence uh, of a huge amount of of uh, 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 you know waste and inefficiency mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we're there in it, it, we're a long way down that road on the journey uh, uh, and that's really the points i'm trying to make i think the community's uh, attitudes and behaviours uh, towards um, uh, tax uh, have changed uh, in, a, in a more um, in a reasonable way as a, as a consequence of the debates we've been having over many years now. OK, thank you. Deputy Taylor. Thank you. Um, so shortly after taking office, uh, this PNR is in the fortunate position to receive an update on the anticipated income from the OECD, OECD Pillar 2 tax regime, and that enabled the committee to put forward uh, proposals for funding the Guernsey Institute. And Deputy Trot, you claimed uh, that it was, quote, not unreasonable to think that this revenue stream could yield 30 to 40 million a year. So very briefly, uh, for the benefit of those listening in, could you give an explanation uh, of what Pillar 2 taxes are? Uh, and within that explanation, could you explain, given we've already committed to spending the money, uh, how confident you are that we'll see those yields? OK, well, P Pillar 2 is a global initiative that taxes uh, businesses that have um, global uh, revenues in excess of 750 million euros. Uh, and we have some uh, businesses in, in our island uh, that fall into that category uh, and therefore will be uh, 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 captured, caught by a, a, a global initiative. Uh, and, and that's important. So we will not be uncompetitive as a consequence of adopting Pillar 2. Uh, people who work in treasury environments uh, are, are naturally cautious uh, and naturally prudent in the numbers that they come up with, and and I think you know 30 million is a uh, is a is a pretty good estimate of, of pillar two, uh, where if it, where it will be from from 2026. However, I'm a natural optimist, uh, and I can uh, I'm aware of some of the businesses uh, within that net that are outperforming. They're already significantly more than that net and therefore by, by as a factor of that will will be paying uh, more tax than I think um, is currently predicted. So could I see that number higher? Yes. Uh, do I think it'll be much lower? No. So there is a you know, you must take into account an optimism, an optimum bias, an optimism bias here. But I, I, I think that number is, 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 you know, could well be higher based on based on what I know, with the exposure that I have uh, to the financial services community in particular. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not losing any sleepless nights about that not materialising. Uh, I think a little bit like ETI, I think it'll surprise us. At least I hope it will surprise us uh, once that revenue stream becomes active. Right. Uh, 2026. 2026 yeah, right. yeah. And it, it came, uh, the change in, in forecast came from having more information, understanding what was happening in the international community and, and how, it, how it would um, pan out to the, the actual structure of it. Um, and I'm, a, I'm looking at a treasurer here who, who has been, been involved in that. And very clearly, it was, it was, it was the emerging situation that enabled a better um, idea about how much money how that would impact us and and so we, we, we now think that we'll get more but that reflects a lot of the conservative view at the time yeah. that they didn't have the information they didn't uh, and it's worth elaborating on that because i know that there are some who, who think this this um you know what a, what a you know kel surprise um we have a new uh, policy and resources committee and suddenly we get uh, that fantastic piece of good news uh, the guidance notes changed uh, during the, the, that, that interim period, i.e. Dur during December, which enabled uh, the staff at the Revenue Service who are experts in these matters to, to, to scrutinise that guidance and, and from that come up with, with uh, these, these forecasts, these predictions. Um, so there was you know, no funny business. It was a case that international standards, international decisions changed uh, and as a consequence, uh, some positive forecasts emerged. 
I just, can I just pick up on what Deputy <coughs> Taylor said about, oh, we'd, we, we'd be spending that money before we got it. Some but, of it. Just yeah, but that yeah. won't be... I mean, we're talking about 2026, when, when that will come in anyway. But we're also talking about a capital programme, though, which, which, which spans several years, and we want to see what's happened in the hospital. It might, might be a delay on that. And these projects are five, ten-year projects as well. So yes, it's but not pa part of Pillar 2 has been linked to the reason why we felt more confident... Yes, because we're looking at the whole year. envelope, but it's different yeah, from yeah, saying... We'll have spend it. We'll be sp spending it right, right away, which we won't. Okay, Deputy Pertoff. Late, the latest uh, Health and Social Care Committee revenue overspend of 1.8%, which equates to 3.9 million pounds, is clearly a concern. Uh, following on from previous large increases in health spending this term, is it your view that health spending is out of control? It's a reflection, if you like, of the circumstances that we find ourselves in with a push coming from the demographic requirement for a whole variety or even quantum of, of people needing particular um, <coughs> circumstances. Um, but I think, as has been mentioned before, a lot of that drive is coming from the cost of agency workers. And it is highlighted by HSC, certainly to PNR, and I'm mean, very much aware of it. And that's not something at the moment that we can do much about. That is going in one direction at the moment, and that is primarily a, a reflection on COVID, as was mentioned before, in terms of the non-availability or people actually making a decision about how they will now move into or move out of the health provision. So it is a reflection, if you like, of market forces to some extent. However, having said that, health costs going forward is our biggest single challenge that we have to be able to accommodate the increase in costs that we know will happen. We can predict that in terms, terms of the amount of people moving through that demographic profile. And that is a real challenge for us to deal with. And consequently, looking at that, and one of, again, in the GWP, one of the reasons that we actually have established that um, particular portfolio is to find whatever models we might be able to use to mitigate that increasing cost of care. But having said that, that will only be able to do that to a degree. What we are going to need, without a doubt, is far more money in the economy to be able to deal with that as far as what government's revenues are looking like. So, and I hesitate to introduce it because I don't really want to talk too much about it, but SLAWS, SLAWS in its own right, is going to add tens of millions per year up over and above what we've already allowed for in terms of long-term care. That money's got to be found every year. We'll hit that buffer actually at the end of this year because we're going to be, we think, at least 30 hospital beds or 30 care beds short and no place to put them. So it's coming at us like a steam train. And I don't think the public have woken up to that fact at the moment, because if we do not find extra revenue, and we'll be as efficient as we can in terms of obviously trying to deal with that, the costs will start to grow vastly over where they currently are. I, I think we're hoping to come on to, to, to long-term care shortly, so I don't want to spend too much time, time on that. But the committee from different perspectives um, that the, the the problems Guernsey's had with the budgeting, uh, and we've done well with Pillar 2 and so on, Deputy Trot's right to be optimistic, uh, 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 and things have been going generally well for the macro economy in the last few months. The problem is the demographic challenge and the long-term, not just long-term care, but the rising medical costs, which affect all societies. And I think all of us, but we might have different input into this know that we as a committee we as a state and we as a society with the public need to have a conversation a debate about renewing the, par the partnership purpose the universal health offering because the the tax issues that deputy trot has just dealt with about what might happen and might not i i was party to one or two of those amendments it's not that i thought rising income tax was a good idea it isn't in some respects it doesn't help us but we have to do something to work around how we're going to finance medical health care and other costs. De De Deputy Gollett, you're, you're creeping into, into answering the next question I was going to ask. Back. The question is sustainability. Have we got a, the, the point is, yes, it's the costs are going to go up. It's how we can mitigate them. And we did have a plan. We do have a strategy. The States has a strategy. And I hate to be the one that is always the one that mentions it, but the Partnership of Purpose. That was a that was, um, 10 year plan to bring in a new sustainable model of health and care. And John's right. Talk, I mean, 
Isle of Man effectively looked at it and, um, and thought, yeah, that's a good idea, made, made that into their model, and now executing it. We, we've, we've fallen behind on that, and we really need to pick up um, the pace on it and, and do it ourselves, which is what um, Deputy Murray has absolutely identified before I got back on the committee as a key a key area of delivery, which is why it's in the government work plan. Um, it's um, portfolio two on um, sustainable health and care services. We've got, um, we're working together now on seeing how we can develop that, how we can support HSC to make that happen. And one of the key areas, which is why, and I'll, I'll come on to this in a minute, is the universal offer and looking at the whole governance model we, we've got at, at the moment. And, and that is something that we're planning on helping to support HSC take forward. We've had We've had discussions with them. In fact, we had a, an hour and a half meeting um, on Tuesday where we covered, covered that off. We really need to pick up the pace on it. We, we can't let it drift any longer. And it's something that now well, I'm sat on P&I, I really am determined to help um, HSC make that happen because we can't afford for things to go up in the way they're going. What we need to do is make sure we've got a model that is more sustainable and meets the needs of, of the community as best we can. We meet regularly on, and, and, and Lyndon Trott, Deputy Trott, with his key facts, one point he's put across very eloquently many times is contrary to popular belief. Most residents and citizens of Guernsey get a very good deal for the tax they pay because they're receiving, in many cases, first-class services better than the UK in, in certain respects. And, and, and I need to renew my care passport, I think, you know. But, but that was another idea, that, that to, to try to work out how much is the community prepared to pay, is it being paid pay, uh, fairly, is there a role for private insurance, do we need to restructure our tax and insurance system to make it more competitive, but, and, and how can we bring in, I won't say more disciplines of the market, but reduce the rate of increase of health costs, and that might involve not just getting rid of agency staff and having a different model, but all those kind of things. I think we, we ought to thank uh, Deputy Fakos for his patience uh, Sorry. Uh, getting to the next question. So oh. uh, thank you, John. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Trot. I mean, what I was trying to get to here is there are clearly factors out of your, outside of your control, and you've made that point very clearly. It's what we can control and what can be done um, by PNR working with HSC to, to, to look at what is appropriate uh, for, for the community moving forward in terms of a healthcare model. Uh, I mean, you've all... We've got, we've got the model. We just so, need to start putting it in place. But, but why isn't that happening? I mean, w w we keep asking the question. Well. Uh, we had quite a, as Heidi's mentioned, we had quite a discussion with HSC over this, the universal offer, because we do have to identify what it is that we can provide under the current circumstances and what we might have to change in terms of charging or commissioning out to a degree, providing obviously it gives us the benefit or not. Um, and what you have to probably recognise is the, the clues in the title. A universal offer is something everybody gets, wherever the circumstances are at this point in time. So if you add, for example, nice drugs, which at the moment is coming out of that health reserve that we have had, but won't exist by 26, when obviously the OHM2, presuming it goes forward, will swallow that up. You've got to take that out of general revenue. And at the moment, that's five and a half million pounds. And that's got to be added to general revenue that we have to find from taxation or whatever circumstances. But the increasing requirement for nice drugs is a reflection, if you like, of, of the, com the difficulties that we do have as an aging population. Cancer, for example, is a little pregnant, whatever. If that is a universal offer, rather than saying it's for a specific group of people, we've got to know that everybody can get a level. Now, if you actually increase the cost at the top by that kind of extent, the only way you can balance the books is to reduce what's actually at the bottom or start charging for some of those things at the bottom. Yeah. And that's kind of the circumstance. And these are really very difficult, contentious issues for us to deal with. But before we even get to that, we need the granularity of understanding of what each of the huge portfolio of services that we provide actually reflects, both in cost, both in people, and how many people are benefiting from that. And that's the work that the portfolio team has now embarked on. Just to add 
back to you, we're talking about, about health. And I think part of the problem we have, and it's just it's, it's crystallised my, my head the other day thinking about this, we look at health and think that's a problem for health and social care. And I remember our health, but health and social care are the ones that effectively are picking up the pieces all the time and, and dealing with the problems and, and, and the illnesses that, that have come along. Health and social care is an all government th it, issue. It, it's fundamental to the cost of government. All the issues that we have in terms of housing, uh, the problems in um, the environment, e e even, but very, and how we, we support um, the, the poorest and, and, and the opportunities we give people, they all have a knock on effect on health. And that health effect then costs health and social care. So the more we can invest in the areas outside health that, that, that prevent. Um, illness that, that, that um, intervene early is where we'll really get a sustainable health service and that's that's what I try and b bash on about it's not just health and health and social care at, at the, the bottom of the, the they have to deal with, with, with all the problems which is why I think public health should be at the centre of government and not stuck in a health committee because their role is absolutely fundamental to understanding the problems of the island the, the work they did on needs assessment I mean I remember the over 50s needs assessment which actually shows it was the under 50s where the real issues and tensions were all the housing issues that we, that we talk about now came out that was in 20, 2018 well, I mean can I come back to a point where Deputy Fairclough asked you um, why you think um, the model or the strategy is not being uh, progressed and your answer was well could you expand on that um, it's, I th it's multifaceted I think I think clearly I think COVID, of course, came along, and, and after that, HSC were having to deal with and picking up the pieces from having to do with... Quite a few years down the line now from that. I get that. I do think there's been... Well, I mean, I have been the standard bearer for the new model, of when, and I don't know whether that things kind of fell away a bit when, when we didn't have the committee that was behind it pu pushing it forward. Um, I think staff were taken away from that committee, which meant they didn't get the support that they needed to actually put forward a sustainable um, health model. It didn't does, give does them... Does your committee have confidence in the Committee for Health and Social Care? Well, I don't see where we would not. I think their problem is, is a, there, there's a lot going on, and I think yeah. what we need to do, and I think this is where absolutely is um, an all government support of, of that committee and understanding what, what their issues are and, and helping helping them through it and I think that's not they haven't had that previously and I think what we're doing is, is trying to well, from the previous policy nettle. and resources you mean well I just don't think I think the part that now and I'm not going to talk about the pre previous committee at all but I do think Bob, Bob in particular has identified it is it is a key aspect of the whole sustainability of government as a whole it's not HSC it's, it's government as a whole I welcome that and I was very and I, that was something that really in, encouraged me so when they added ad, made that a key aspect of the government work plan I think that is the way to go we can't just just dump it on one committee and expect them to be able to sort it out but I do think there are multifaceted reasons why that progress hasn't been made it frustrates me intensely but I think now the states have said yes we, we think that you should be doing that P&R, so I'm, re I'm grateful that we can. I, I, I want to just add two, two, two items to it. I, you asked, is health spending out of control? I think the answer to that question is no, it's not. Um, uh, it, it, it was, it, there was an overspend, uh, and that's, uh, you know, regrettable. But bear in mind that committee expenditure was 560 and a half million last year which represented an aggregate underspend of nearly £12 million. So despite the setback with health, um, uh, overall uh, we were £12 million better than we'd, uh, we expected. And, and I think some credit uh, must be given to the previous, the previous committee for that. But there is no doubt that health has got a voracious appetite. He health inflation runs much higher uh, than, than uh, standard inflation. Um, and uh, if you said to be the que if you'd pose the question, does does health have the capacity mm -hmm. to get to a stage where it's out of control? The answer to that question is an unreserved yes, uh, because for the reasons that both Deputy Murray and Deputy Soulsby uh, have highlighted, uh, because the the, the 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 cost around long term care with us all living older is very material indeed, and uh, we need to address it. 
And I've, oh. I've made clear, I think not having a chief officer in that committee has had an impact. I think that okay. having that overall direction that can work at that strategic level, I think um, we, we had that, that support. And I, I, it was all right for me when that, that all disappeared because I knew I was on top of, uh, of my brief. But with a new committee coming in, not having a chief officer, as, as, I mean, like, this is not undermining anybody else who is working there because I know they're all, they're all really good. But having that chief officer role it absolutely makes a difference and I'm not saying every committee needs that at all but I do think having that strategic head who is there working for the committee at that time I think is really important. Could you be bringing that forward as part of the reshaping government review then? Um, I think, well, you might make a really good point there because I think the whole, that reshape, reshaping government, it's all gone off on a tangent on whether we should have executive government or, or um, a a committee government. Mission. But actually, it's about working in tandem with, with mm. having that civil service structure. We spent the whole of one term going through um, changing the machinery of government. Um, of what we did with politicians and how many we had. We did nothing on the civil service, and then two years later into the new term, everything was changed on the civil service, which had, took no account of where we were in terms of um, politically. Some of that might have worked, but I think particularly I think it will have impacted health. I, I agree I with Mr. Heidi. Sorry, John, just one second. Can I ask Mr. Degari what his view would be of such a structure with chief officers? The, I, I certainly can recognise the, the merit um, in, in a setting like um, health and social care. Um, the, um, but the, and I do understand that um, the, the concept um, has been under and is under active discussion with the, the group that Deputy Murray now sits on um, within um, policy and resources. So, yes, which I think is another... We've got some questions yes, on that if so we get I, to them. So maybe, yes. <laughs> OK, thank you. Deputy Sorry, Bevington. can I just close out the question? On, because I think the point that Heidi's made is really quite relevant in terms of the impact on the economy of making health as effective as we can. At the moment, because of the lack of housing for the increasing requirement that they have for staff agency or otherwise, what they're doing is bed blocking the whole island because they've got their staff in almost any piece of accommodation they can find right throughout the island. And what that's doing is denying the opportunity for other elements of the economy to be able to utilise that temporary space as and when they need it. And there's no let up in that. And at the moment, obviously, by the end of this year, we've now currently got a, a dispensation to allow us to occupy short term some of the tourism co accommodation. One may have to have that replaced again and extended again because we just don't have anywhere to put them. So it's not just essential, if you like, for the health of in islands generally. It's actually for the health of the economy because basically the health is invading areas of you know, our, our, our ability to service our economy and grow our economy. And unfortunately, they don't have a choice. Um, so, you know, it, it's a contributory factor. So it is a really important issue to, to, to deal with the whole health issue, you know, in totality, basically. Thank you. Just, I, I, just to be aware, too, that that's why the GWP requested for that sustainability committee, a portfolio, £500,000 over this year and £500,000 over the next year to be able to put additional resource in. Because if we start pulling people out of health to try to look at that themselves, we've got a backfill. We've got to be able to find that. So with, there is the additional resource, but obviously this is a major difficulty that we've actually got before us. And I appreciate some of these questions are, are for health, and, and there will be an opportunity to ask those. Uh, I'm well aware of that. Um, we could spend the rest of this hearing just on health alone, but I, I'm keen to move on, but actually pick up on, on the long-term care issue, because last year PNR did a joint presentation with the Committee for Employment and Social Security uh, to states members on potential proposals for the sustainability of long-term care, as I'm sure you're aware. Presumably, you're still working with ESS on this because um, revisiting the timeline, that was um, the policy letter was due to be debated on the 24th of this month. When can we now expect to see uh, proposals for that? Uh, personally, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 um, there, are, there are differing views around the Policy and Resources Committee as to how this should be progressed. Uh, 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 colleagues will speak for themselves, but there is a, a view um, that uh, this should not be a, a matter that is uh, uh, addressed unilaterally. Uh, it should be addressed as part of a, uh, a suite of matters in, in order that uh, the overall picture can be, can be understood. 
Uh, one thing I, I can tell you is that there isn't appetite by majority, in fact, I'm not sure whether it's by majority or, or, or unanimously, uh, to bring in uh, the principal private residence into the calculation, and I think that's recently found its way into the media. That, that is um, one area uh, where there is a, 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 a disagreement of views, a parting of views. Uh, but what I think most of us have said is that we will consider any funding op option um, but not, we don't want to do that on a unilateral basis. We, we, want, we want the full picture to be presented. And, um, uh, and that um, requires a sense of coordination that I think um, ESS in particular uh, would, uh, would don't, I don't believe is, is appropriate. They would rather sort of, you know, um, bat on uh, and get this position around long-term care uh, dealt with um, separately. Heidi? Yeah, I know. I agree with Lyndon here. I mean, I've, I've got a real concern about just isolating slaws and say, right, now we need, uh, we're looking for another 35 million, whatever it is. Um, so how are we going to, going to raise it? We had a whole year on the tax review. This was one reason why I was n unhappy with how the tax review was undertaken. It was looked at in isolation. We looked at general revenue and a bit and reform of, um, supposed reform of um, social Social Security contributions, but that didn't include slaws. So we were going, they were going out saying we need uh, an extra 80 or however mil 100 million pounds, but no one said, oh, yeah, but actually, when we've done this, we're going to need another 35 million for slaws. The public was saying, what the heck is going on here? And, I, and I, that was a real concern for me. We need to be open and transparent with the public and also work with the public on this. We're so, I mean, the way the tax review was done, right, we're going to hear all these ideas, but just it's expect but the best thing. And we said, well, we need to work with the community in coming up with, with what. What we think is, is, a, is the best option we can take. We need to t think about intergenerational fairness. Um, it's all very well if we're saying, right, we're not, saying, right, we're not going to um, get people to t um, uh, take a, a, a part of their, their home, the cost of their home, to, to pay for it. Well, that will mean then everybody will say it's, it, it's contributions, isn't it? But that, that's at the same time as we've got secondary pensions in. ESS are wanting to do um, social security reform on top of that. And we're just not looking at it in the round. For me, we have to look at it who's going to be impacted by what when and I think looking at slaws in isolation will, will, will be an issue we've seen it already I, this is what, exactly what I said had happen if you do slaws independent like this the whole cop talking about um, principal private residence and taking your home away will but, happen and that's exactly but, what but, has but, happened but with the greatest of respect until the committee changed this was on course to come back to the states this month uh, um, public engagement activity was scheduled in for November and December of last year, yeah. and, and we are on so course at least yeah. to have the debate. Yeah, yeah. The absolutely. Answer, the answer to your question yeah. is September at the earliest, uh, but, it, but it, may, it, may, it may not be a matter uh, to which the committees find themselves in agreement. Can but I September I at the earliest. Because I can't see that... It's described as deadlock by the Guernsey Press. Is, is that a fair reflection on the, of the situation? And no, we Peter Verbush yeah. went... Until such time as the... And until I took such as the policy letter it is published, uh, it, it's too early to say. Um, but there is a fundamental uh, difference of opinion. I can't hide from that, both in terms of what should be in scope uh, and, indeed, when the matter uh, should be debated. Now, one of the arguments that's being put forward is that the care homes need certainty and they need it, they need it quickly. Uh, personally, I think that's a strong argument because funding models uh, depend on, on policy direction in, in, in this particular environment. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's also very easy to see how important it is to present the big picture. Uh, I try to, try to present these numbers uh, in a simple way, but in doing so, I oversimplify them in order to ensure that the, our community can get a broad picture of, of, of what we... I mean, the way I do that, for instance, I, you know, I said the deficit for last year represents about 2% uh, on the personal rate of income tax. Uh, uh, but, but it's not quite right, but that only looks at the legacy issues. The real challenges are the challenges that, that we face, particularly around long-term care. Um, but that's not the only challenge we face. So uh, if you look at these things in isolation, you've got much more chance of piling on uh, uh, um, uh, tax pressure. Uh, without, without people fully understanding uh, uh, across the board uh, where, where and why those pressures have emerged in the, in the way that they have. One of my concerns is leaving it. It is, it is like it, we're this far into, into the term. The states couldn't make a decision two years ago, um, a year ago, which is two years towards the end of this term, that 
whether the, we can make that this states can make the right decision at this state and make a decision at all by the end of this term on to, on, on this particular aspect, I, I think is questionable. But the states has already said to PNR that it has to come back in either June or September 26, depending on which proposition y you look at. Uh, to look at everything in the round anyway. So for me, it's about that whole piece about informing the public, talking to the public, working together, whether it's citizens' assemblies, I don't know, but certainly working with the public and speaking with them, not to them. And I think that's that's my problem in this, this consultation that will go out and saying these are the problems with slaws. But it's all, it's all connected. Health is connected from one, one aspect to another. And I think that's what we need to look at, have it, that grown-up conversation. But I wanted the consultation to go out. I was just unhappy with the economic model, perhaps, and the fiscal... You see, I was a rebel a bit of a dissent on ESS because I wasn't entirely convinced that what the committee as a majority were putting forward was entirely palatable. But I was informed that there would be options in the report that the state's members would read and deliberate on and maybe amend or choose. That in those days, Deputy Fairclough is quite correct, Deputy Furbush was the representative on Slaws. When we had the change, I kind of took on that role. Uh, but I'm aware that there are differences across policy and resources. We have lost a lot of time because of the unsettled nature of last year's politics. Uh, and, and I do concur that, it, that really uh, the appetite for paying more should have been embraced within our overall context of not just the Universal Health Service, but also the GST, for example. Um, it, it might have made the GST debate different, but okay. that's another topic. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, me right. So in the funding investment plan, it was agreed as part of the core tax measures uh, that 10 million would be raised from transport taxes and 5 million from other corporate entities. And that's, that's outside of the pillar two income. So these two measures represent um, a worthwhile contribution to eliminating the deficit. So when do you expect to bring proposals forward to the states? The transport side also involves e and I, and we have had a couple of meetings. Uh, we've had one with the last PNR. We've had one more recently. Um, and obviously we're trying to agree what that could look like in terms of options. Um, but it's something that we have to work together to, to bring forward. Um, and, you know, there are different ways of cutting it. And obviously we've got to find the best possible way, that, or the most effective way, that will raise the sort of money that we actually do require. Um, and, you know, clearly anything to do with transport, whether it's parking or, you know, um, fees for an annual, um, you know, that has to be annually renewed, they are going to be controversial. No secret. I mean, Peter Roffey has said on a number of occasions, good luck with that, because, you know, these are issues that have actually come up before. Um, and so consequently, you know, any increase is obviously going to be a challenge for us to bring across. But we've got to get to something that is actually acceptable to all parties that can start to generate the extra revenue that clearly will start to take a bit of a, you know, a bite out of that difficulty that we've currently got. So I can't, I, you know, we, we have had a meeting, I don't know, about two months ago, I think, on that. Officers are still, you know, reviewing, obviously, the opportunities for that. We don't yet have a date as to when that might come forward. Right, sorry. Um, reshaping government. Yes. Priority four of the government work plan concerns reshaping government, and this was envisaged in the 2021 policy letter as largely revolving around the public service transformation and how the public service is organised. What plans will be brought forward in this document to achieve public service transformation? I've been probably the most involved of recently on this. Um, uh, John will be taking over from me on that one. Actually, already has, and Heidi preceded me on that. So we've all got a little bit of that puzzle at this stage. Um, uh, John, and John, John Latock, of course, also, who is not here, has now actually been the, the regular permanent member throughout the entire period at this stage. Um, I think the challenge that we found here, uh, that there is actually, you know, a proposal for, uh, that's come forward for endorsement or at least to take to the states, which we haven't yet necessarily signed off on. Um, it would be fair to say, I think, that it is not revolutionary, and I think that was intentional because by the time that all of the preparatory work had been done to look at what options we might have, and because there were some members had sort of come and gone, and there clearly was dissent 
in that committee, without a doubt. There were some polarised views. So you're looking really at the lowest common denominator that you can find agreement on to actually bring something back. Um, and consequently, what is in train at this point in time is something akin to looking at the um, policy council approach we used to have, but with changes. Um, and also, as a consequence, the role of the chief minister, treasury and so forth is, is part of you know, how that would work with that. Um, the attention there really is because one of the major challenges that we clearly are all aware of is we don't have a forum for strategy development. We don't. It comes from committees up. And then, obviously, what you've got is a bun fight as to who gets the priority as a consequence of that. That's not the way to do government. It can't be. Um, but we don't have a forum that allows that. PNR, if you like, have the ability to fund development, but actually any committee is free to come forward with whatever they do, and we have limited powers in terms of how we can influence that other than maybe not support the financial side of things. So what we've come up with, as far as I can recall, um, is, yes, there would be a... And the other members of that policy council would be the presidents of the current committees or more or less there were some changes that were suggested where some of those areas could actually be looked at in terms of commissioned basis so for example what was being explored was sport could be a commissioned service rather than you know a requirement for education sport and culture at this point in time so those kinds of changes could be looked at there was also the suggestion that actually what we might be able to do um, is to uh, look at whether or not we could reduce to a degree the amount of states members that we have, but not to a considerable degree. Um, and we also looked at what the Alderney representation should look like in terms of, if you like, their contribution to what we actually do. So those are some of the areas. But what we then recognised, of course, is, and it's been mentioned before, the public sector, the, 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 the officer, uh, the civil service, needed to reflect any change that we make in that. And that was still being sort of worked yeah, through. That's very much the question I'm trying to ask here, because it seems to me from the limited amount of information that's filtered out to those not otherwise involved in it, that what was apparently envisaged originally to be something which was much more about the actual public sector staff rather than the political level um, was where the focus was, mm. and there was a, a sort of a, a small side work stream attached on about machinery of government. Reversed, and it appears to have reversed. It yeah. appears to be all about how many deputies we've got, whether we're going to call them a policy council, and, yeah. and the other matters you have states. And it seems yeah. to have had a mission creep away from the um, staff level and towards the political level. Um, so, so I find that quite interesting. I don't know if you've got any comment on that. But I suppose my other question is, when the policy letter comes... Will any of the proposals be um, for taking effect in 2025, in particular that any reduction I in the number of states don't members? think it would be feasible for that to happen. Right. Um, I think that would be too short a time frame for us to make any change of any real description. So on either side of the equation, whether it's, whether it's at staff yeah. level, notwithstanding we already had a in very interesting point about chief officers. Indeed. Um, yeah. that there is, it's going, and it's going to be a green paper, is it? We don't know. Uh, that was one of the options that we might have so that okay. we have a free debate about this. Um, I think it's unlikely that PNR as a group, or maybe possibly by a majority, would actually support something, but not unanimously. There are different views around the table on that, which is challenging, obviously. And obviously the, the key question surrounding a green paper is the ability for it to be amended or Indeed. not. And is that something Absolutely. that's in your thinking? We're also aware, if you like, that it would, might be preferable to have something that could be amended rather than a raquette that might come as a consequence. Um, so, yeah, uh, th these are definitely uh, you know, areas that we are concerned about at the moment. But I think in terms of the point that you make, I think what we've got to be careful of here is that we actually, that the political um, uh, representation and its support mechanism are in, in you know, they are working mm -hmm. together. Um, now, perhaps the original drive was to try to get the civil service to reflect but if there's going to be a change in the way that we approach it from a political perspective, then obviously that would need to reflect that as well. Um, but I have to say that I think the civil service involvement has become a secondary issue. Uh, the focus what, what clearly happened, has been... What happened to... to I, can, I can only speak as I find. I mean, that we, we were... Obviously, Heidi's got a piece of that puzzle at this point in time. John Latock has been there throughout. But I think a lot of research was done initially on other models in other places to see what we might perhaps be able to look at. Um, that took up a period of time. I then took over when Heidi stood down for a period of time. At that stage, John Latock took over as basically the chairman of, of the group. John obviously has got considerable um, uh, requirements in his external affairs relationship. So there was a bit of a hiatus. 
And then I think people realised that actually time was getting on much quicker than we'd realised and would want. So it was what can we achieve within the time frame realistically and not try to come back too controversially, where clearly there would be a challenge, a huge challenge potentially back. So I think that's what we've got to... GPEG's contribution is quite interesting, but again, it's late at the party for this term. Uh, 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 and yeah, we, I agree with the broad thrust of what's being presented, although there's items I might disagree with. But I was on SAC before Deputy Burford <laughs> came, and we had a, sa a sort of Deputy Prayer Club too. We had a sort of second hand awareness of this because we had updates every month or two on how it was going, but we knew that there were vast differences of opinion. The mission creep is an excellent point, because in the... I would have preferred the reshaping of government. I don't like the word machinery, really. <laughs> uh, the, the transformation. To have focused more on the functions. Have we got it right with mixing environment and infrastructure? Do we need a transport department? Do we need a culture uh, and sports commission stroke department those are the kind of uh, th do we need a housing separate min do we want ministers back and I would probably say yes to that uh, those are the questions that interest me more than, than some of the material in the report well, it, I mean it was a painful experience from when I was on there um, it, it, and it, it, it did kind of get sidetracked and it was trying trying to find any way forward was was quite difficult when when I was on there but it was very much thinking what what is it what's where are the issues and how do, how do we solve them uh, and that's how it started and then it did go it, it's clearly gone off to um, something uh, which I think we're, we're missing the, the the fundamental areas but it should be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Yeah. I, I don't support the what's called executive government. I think a lot of those who do think um, that they only see one side of the equation, um, giving members of the government more power rather than the, uh, the, the scrutiny function we're, where we are at the moment. <laughs> The, the other thing Gary, I, I think you wanted to come in, did you? Yeah. No, I, di I did, actually. I, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that, um, especially to everybody listening in, um, they're, they're getting the wrong impression. The, the terms of reference for this piece of work were, were to look at the structure of government and then make sure that the civil yes. service or the public yes. service was shaped to support okay. whatever that decision. Exactly. So it wasn't the primary focus was on restructuring the civil service and then... It was actually it wanted to make sure that the civil service would be responses yeah. Yeah. to um, okay. to whatever that shape but was. To, to, to reference it, and, yes. and I'd also make a point: the SAC are uh, encouraging potential candidates for the next election to come forward, and that's great. But I think one of the aims of this work stream is actually to encourage the most able, competent, diverse, uh, you know. A myriad of people and I think that's also part of it so that we can inc increase part meaningful participation and the quality of our politics and behaviours because from the, fi the final policy letter that we that ended up being resulting in the new machinery government it said it should be reviewed at, that, at this time so it's exactly what we, we were following up it wasn't any attempt to bring in a whole new structure and adding new, new policy councils or, or anything but looking at things, say housing, should we have a housing committee now, given all the issues we've got and we don't? And that's caused, I think, has really caused an issue. Yeah. Deputy Fairclough. Yeah, yeah I mean, we spoke, we've spoken about mission creep. I think, I think we've uh, crept, crept o over the time a bit here. So what, what we think is going to happen, we think the subcommittee is going to propose to PNR. Uh, that we bring a, a state's report forward that um, proposes the instigation of a special investigations committee next time round with a particular focus on the machinery of government. So that sounds like it is. It's an attempt to kick the can down the road into the next I assembly. <laughs> yeah, no, I know you would have. I, I, I enjoyed beating you to it. Um, but uh, but the, the, the point that, that, that I think has been made is, is, is that there have been a lack of resources, which has made it a challenge. Um, uh, but also the, uh, the component parts of the committee have changed on a number of occasions uh, and, and haven't always, I think, found it as easy to find meeting dates um, uh, mutually convenient. So there's been, there's been lots of reasons why, why it hasn't progressed expeditiously, but they, they want, they want a, a bigger specific organ next time round, and it'll be up to us to decide whether or not to support that initiative and bring it forward. Okay. Thank you. I mean, you speak about 
kicking a can down the road. How about kicking it down a tunnel? Uh, Jer Jersey's uh, investigating a tunnel to France and a presentation uh, locally described how Guernsey could also get involved. What is PNR's view on a fixed link to Jersey and do you intend to commit to a feasibility study to examine its potential? I think regardless of the mechanics or even the costs, I don't think anybody's asked the Guernsey public whether they would want that proximity to first Jersey and then to the, to, to the mainland Europe. And that is a kind of big issue. You know, I don't think, frankly, that we could facilitate it financially or practically for the amount of space that we would need for that to happen. I mean, you'd have to have a terminal and so forth, or a train or whatever. That would take up a lot of space, but that, by the by. I think it's a major undertaking in terms of a project to do that. And nothing's impossible with the right amount of money. And we're not saying necessarily the states would have to fund it. But at the end of the day, taxpayers would actually have to pay for using it. So they'd have to recover their costs anyway. So whatever that cost is going to be, somebody's going to end up paying the bill, and it would be islanders partially paying for that. But I think more importantly, it changes our relationship with Europe. Now, Jersey may be happy to have that proximity, and I mean they have, because they are closer to Europe, or to, to France particularly, they may be quite happy to embrace that. But actually it changes all manner of things. And I don't think that we've actually got a mandate from the public to change the way that we actually are currently structured. And I would like to see that first. Okay. Uh, we are running slightly over. Thank you for your forbearance. So just one more question from Deputy Taylor, and then we'll be wrapping up. It's, apologies, it's not the most exciting question to them, but uh, we know from recent data release uh, by the Revenue Service that a significant backlog exists for tax returns uh, and their processing. So when do you envisage that this backlog will be fully addressed? I mean, I'm happy to start on that. I, I agree. It's, it's not been great. I mean, a lot of people have been impacted by it. But um, from the figures we've had, and we have been since, since we took um, office, have been, have been pushing to see what, what, what can be done, what more can be done. Um, but we do understand that actually inroads have, have been made. I think um, temporary staff have been brought in. Previous staff who've come out of retirement, I think, have, 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 have supported it. I think it's all, there have also been issues with the change of um, IT systems that have, have impacted. And trying to find staff, it's really, really difficult, the number of vacancies they've got. But from, from what we've heard, that the um, number of persons... I've got a few stats here from the 2020 return, which links... 2022, and I, I, the, the release that went out the other day made it look like we're going. Oh, we're talking about not 2019, but we weren't. You know, you're talking two years later because they relate to particular years. So, the, for the 2020 return for 2022, it, it was last year it was 60, 69% complete for personal returns, and now it's 79% complete. Um, um, and corporates 93% complete for the 2020 return. And 2021's gone from 49% last year to 61% for personal returns complete and 83% corporate. And now, we, as I think was said recently, for 2022, they are the most current. 36% of personal ones have been done, 16% uh, like of corporate, but corporates come in, always come in later and then in, in a big, big whack. So they're getting through it, but um, we are, th there are problems with, with the staffing, the, the lot of um, lot of queries. Um, we have talked also about um, what would be the impact of bringing in the independent taxation, because that, that is a concern. You know, if, if it's a problem now, what will it be like um, if, when, when that's brought in? We, we were advised it might not be such an issue it might make things easier because of big problems that they they tend to have certainly with personal returns if you've got a married couple they might divorce or then they get married or things change with and you're having two, effectively two returns on one so it might not it might actually simplify matters so more more returns can actually be automatically approved and i think more and more are happening like that and it it helps them um, if, if more and more people do it online so i don't know if beth you want to add any more in your i think that's the answer i think it's, okay. it's all about the new system and doing yeah. online returns. I mean, it's obviously a matter of great concern to many people Ab absolutely and, and yeah i mean i, I know people I, I, I've, got, I've got family members who have been impacted as well and i totally i totally understand that and but i do know the team are working as hard as they can to complete but but as you see they are getting on top of it the majority um and are, are, are being done okay we have many more questions, but we don't have any more time. So um, I would just say thank you to all of our witnesses for attending and increasing um, public awareness 
of the and understanding of the work done by your committee. I know that's something you're very keen on, um, Deputy Trot, with your uh, fact today. Um, so scrutiny, we undertake regular public hearings to increase public understanding in areas of government and enhance openness and transparency. And with that in mind, our next hearing will be on the 2nd of May in the afternoon at 15.30 with the Committee for Health and Social Care. And the hearing's now closed. Thank you. Thank you very much.